This screencast is one in a series on process calculations. The title of this screencast is Systems and System Boundaries. The content is the following. First, we're going to talk about systems and the characteristics of systems. Then, we're going to introduce the system boundary as an important concept. Then, a small view of what we mean with an element, component, and an inert in this context. Then, a very important calculation property, and that is a stream variable. And finally, I'm going to discuss some system levels and what can be appropriate in, under various situations. Systems, that is a wide concept. Still, it has a definition, and that is that a system is a set of interacting or interdependent entities forming an integrated whole. So the important words here are whole, that is the system, but also the fact that it is composed of different parts that have a dependence upon each other. In environmental engineering, what kind of systems are of primary interest? Now, one example is, of course, ecosystems. A natural system with very many interact parts. We have a wastewater treatment plant, which is an engineered system. Various compartments, we can see them as basins or reactors or vessels where some chemical reactions take place. And they're definitely connected and very interdependent on each other. We have industrial manufacturing systems that has a lot of similarities with the wastewater treatment plant. And we have groundwater systems. It's easy to think that groundwater system is just some water flowing somewhere where you can't see it. But in fact, there's a lot of and the gas, etc. Going back to the definition, systems have certain properties. And some properties are structure. It has a structure, which means that the system is defined by parts and their composition. Taking the water treatment plant as an example, uh, we have an alignment of the various parts. We have pipes that connect the parts to each other. That is one level of structure in this particular system. We also have interconnectivity. The various parts of a system have functional as well as structural relationships. So if we start with the structural relationships, the pipes connecting the various vessels are examples of the structural relationships. When it comes to the functional relationships, we have one example right here, where the reactions taking place in one vessel has impact on the reactions that take place in the next vessel. And that is functional relationships. The system also have behavior, which involves inputs, processing within the system, and outputs of material, energy, or information. You cannot talk about systems without introducing the concept of system boundary. And the system boundary defines which entities are inside the system and which are outside the system, thus are a part of the surrounding environment. In fact, there is no unambiguous definition of a system. The systems are all defined by its system boundary. One important property is whether a system is open or closed. And it's the nature of the system boundary that defines that. An open system allows material, energy, or information to flow in and or out of a system. In closed systems, boundary does not allow flows in and or out. Before I continue with the actual calculations methodology, I just want to make some definitions with regard to substances. With element, I will mean an atom or non-reactive single atom ion. For example, chloride, calcium ion, or carbon. They have the property that they are conservative. That means that they cannot be produced or they cannot be consumed. Components are more or less well-defined multi-atom substances. For example, chloride gas, calcium chloride salts, or organic carbon. Organic carbon, the carbon included in an organic compound. One property that the components have, that the elements do not have, is that they may be produced or consumed in chemical reactions. I'm also going to talk about inert components, for example, nitrogen gas. Nitrogen gas behaves like an atom, but it is a component. So inerts, they fall somewhere in between elements and components. When we make process calculations, 
we're going to make the calculations in terms of stream variables. A stream variable is the calculation entity used to quantify fluxes of elements or components across a system boundary. For example, if we have a physical macroscopic stream of liquid, gas or solids, we may denote that Q, and the unit could be cubic meters per second. This stream contains elements, components or inerts, and the content of these elements or components in that stream is denoted C for concentration, mole per cubic meter, kilograms per cubic meter, etc. But to represent and quantify the flux, we introduce the stream variable that represent a certain substance in a certain stream. And if we make the calculations in weight units, the stream variables are denoted W, and they are the product of Q times C, and the unit could be kilograms per second. If we're talking about molar fluxes, as stream variables represented in molar units, we will use F, which will be Q times C. And the picture to the right illustrates two physical flows, one entering a system, one leaving a system, and the mass flow of a substance in the input stream is represented by the stream variable W1, or mass flux leaving the system, is represented by W2. Let us discuss a water treatment plant in terms of system levels, structure, including some subsystems, interconnectivity, and also a little bit about the behavior. This aerial photograph of a water treatment plant illustrates the complexity of engineered. It's very important to be able to quantify the fluxes between the various parts of this complex water treatment plant system. Also, process calculations can be used to design such systems, not only to understand them. So what the taxpayers pay for when it comes to water treatment is to have an input stream of water with organic carbon, organic nitrogen, organic phosphorus and some solids, that is the wastewater that comes into a treatment plant and there's another stream that leaves with organic carbon with some nitrogen in the form of nitrate and phosphorus. So that is actually the most sim simplified picture of a water treatment plant. If we look at the inputs and outputs, we get a more realistic picture of how the water treatment plant works, what it does, and what it takes to make it work. If we start from the left, we have the input stream, and the first thing that happens uh, in the process is that, is that solids are removed. After that, carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and nitrogen in the form of nitrogen gas leave the system. A little bit further in the process, we need to add oxygen, which is an input. And later in the treatment process, we need to add iron in the form of iron ions. And we have a sludge in an output stream from the water treatment plant. So in terms of inputs and outputs, this is one representation of a water tr uh, treatment plant. But this picture says nothing about what actually goes on within the system. Even if we make the most simple representation, we see that it contains a lot of separate entities which are connected to each other and are interdependent on each other. In the first phase, we have the solid separation, then we have a process called denitrification, where nitrate is transformed to a nitrogen gas. And after that, we have the nitrification, where ammonia is oxidized so to nitrate with the help of microbes. And the final stage is the phosphorus removal, where iron is added. So this is a good example of structure and interconnectivity within an engineered system. Just some comments about this. When it comes to system levels, we must recognize that any system may be understood at different levels. And all system levels involve simplifications. Even the more complicated picture I showed of the uh, water treatment plant includes very, very many simplifications. To form a relevant structure, we need to build an understanding of the processes taking place and that the comp complexity with respect to interconnectivity increases drastically with each level of detail that we introduce. 
When we analyze systems, we must determine the appropriate system level according to the purpose of the analysis and the calculations that we are about to make and the information that is available. And the system level is determined by defining the system boundary. To give three examples, let's find the appropriate system levels to answer how much carbon dioxide is emitted from the water treatment plant, how much iron is needed in the process, and what is the N removal capacity of the water treatment plant. To start with the first one, we can actually use this level of detail. We can use the overall picture, overall input-output, and only focus on the fluxes of carbon in and out of the system. The next one is how much iron is needed. And then we can restrict our analysis to the final physical entity of the water treatment plant. We draw the system boundary around this entity and we see that we have two input fluxes, one of phosphorus coming in from the left and the iron here represented as coming from above. And we have two output fluxes, one with the treated water, the blue arrow that includes phosphorus, and also we have the, the sludge. For the question, what is the end removal capacity, things become much more complicated. And that is because there's an interconnectivity between the two physical units. The nitrogen reactions take place, and that interconnectivity is complex. In order to analyze a system like this, minimum uh, appropriate system level to understand this is actually to see these two entities as two separate systems that are interconnected. And we clarify that they are separate systems by drawing system boundaries around each subprocess. Some comments. A systems thinking is a problem-solving approach that focuses on the whole, not on, on the parts. And in engineering design, system thinking involves the whole is broken down into parts, such as with the water treatment plant. We call it analysis. But also which is the design exercise, the parts must be combined to form a desired whole again, and that is the synthesis. And during this process of systems thinking, the parts are treated as small systems with specific boundaries. And I want to stress that the system boundaries must be included in order to define a system at all. And if we don't define a system, we cannot make any calculations with respect to that system. Only fluxes that cross a system boundary may be quantified. To repeat, the content of this lecture was definition of systems, the concept of system boundaries, definitions of elements, components, and inerts, the concept of stream variables, and we also had a discussion about system levels and appropriate levels and the consequences of choosing a certain system level.